We thank you for the opportunity that we have in life to gather with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to share time and, and study in one another's life, to think about our home that you have prepared for us, to prepare ourselves for the glory that you live in. We thank you for the fellowship, the friendship, the joy that we derive from one another as we walk together in this life. We pray your blessings on us. Father, we ask your special blessing to be with Johnja this week, that you'll provide for her and the surgery that she's going to undergo. We pray that the doctors will be competent, that they will accomplish exactly what they want to, and that it will be effective in taking care of her challenges and restoring her abilities to do the things that she wants to do. We pray that you will hold her closely in your hands, that you'll provide her with the deepest blessings that she needs, that you will watch over her and strengthen her and comfort her and protect her. Father, we're thankful for so many blessings in life. We thank you for our families, for each day of life. We thank you for opportunities that abound around us, for blessings that you pour out on us every day, many of which we fail to recognize in our busy lives as we go through. We ask, Father, that you will help us each day, one by one, to see the, the blessings that you've provided and to be thankful for them. Father, we ask that you will help us as we go through each day of life. Forgive us of our sins. Watch over us. Father, we pray your blessings on those of this congregation who have ongoing needs. We ask that you will bring Barbara back to her full state of health and soon back again with us. Others who have been away, we pray that will soon be back with us. Father, we pray that the health concerns that as a world we have struggled with will soon be past us and that we will move toward a return to the kinds of blessings that we had before often unaware of how blessed we were. Father, we ask that you go with us through this day. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to serve you faithfully in life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35. But some will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Paul's next discussion is a question or a couple of questions, arguments, objections, if you will. Um, and we forget perhaps sometimes that the background of all of the issues in 1 Corinthians 15 are the doubters. Those who questioned whether or not Jesus had been raised from the dead and or doubted that he had been raised from the dead. Remember, as Paul begins the chapter, not everyone got to see Jesus raised. Only a relative few. And he lists many of those as, as we have, uh, have gone through in the past. But like us, they did not see Jesus raised. So they had the testimony of Jesus raised. They had the, uh, the arguments that were presented. Uh, now Paul is dealing with another one. And uh, the, the question is, well, how could people be raised from the dead when we know what happens to bodies when people die? What happens to our bodies when we die? Decay. Okay, that's a big word. <laughs> Decay. Well, what, what does it mean? <laughs> what does it look like in real life? <laughs> well, it's not, not pleasant to look at. You've seen animals on the side of the road that have been there for several weeks. We, we return to dust. Yeah, that's a good place to be. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say something, but I'll just skip right over that. Uh, we will return to dust. Uh, from the dust we were made to the dust we will return. Uh, that was God's statement to Adam after he and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden. Um, what prevented them from returning to dust was the tree of life, which they would be barred from. And so that meant there was going to be one end to them, guaranteed. 
they would return to the earth. Just like all of us will. All of our bodies will return to the earth. Well, people have not uh, just found that out recently. They've known it for a long, long time. So it, it asks a relatively natural question. Okay, if your body is going to fall apart, disintegrate, go into various pieces, burned up, eaten up, a variety of different ways in which people are, uh, are lost. Um, how are you going to raise up that body? How are you going to get it back? And it's not just a question of curiosity, like, you know, how is God going to do this? But it's rather a question of doubt. We don't believe it's going to happen. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus deals with one of the issues that the, the, uh, the Sadducees brought up disputing the resurrection. And they had the little story, as you recall, um, the circumstances around um, a man and a woman who were married. And the man dies, and the woman then marries her, his, his brother, the man's brother. And then he dies, and then another brother marries her. And you know that we call this, after the Old Testament law, of Leverite marriage. That is... If a man's family had a unmarried male in the family and your older brother died, the younger brother was responsible for marrying the widow and raising up children in the name of the dead brother. Um, so it would be his offspring. And um, it's a strange law for us, but that was what God had given to the children of Israel. And so they had concocted this scenario that seven brothers all had been married to this one woman and then they all die and then the question was, well, whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection since they all had her? Well, they weren't concerned a bit about who was going to be married to that woman. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And they considered this to be an insurmountable problem since you could now have that woman married to seven people. Jesus answers it simply not with the question or the answer that they were expecting though. He said, you're not going to be married in heaven, so none of them will be married to her. When they ask this question, it's not because they really want to know how is our body going to be, but rather, we don't think it's going to happen. It's an objection to the concept of the idea of resurrection. So uh, why do we doubt things? We doubt things because we have weakness. We can't do it, therefore we think someone else can't do it. But God can. God can do it. All right, so Paul is going to have some contrasts here. Um, we are eventually going to talk about, it may take me a little bit to get there, the, what has been sown and raised. Verse 35. Someone will say, how are the dead raised up? With what body do they come? Verse 36. Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases to each seed its own body. You ever planted anything from seed? Yes. Yes? What did you plant? Well, give me one of them. Squash. Squash. You grow squash from seed. And okra from seed. What else from seed? About everything. Flowers. Some flowers. Corn, beans. Mm -hmm. Corn, beans, peas. All right, let's suppose that you put one of those in the ground. What does it look like when you put it in the ground? A seed, whatever it is. When you put it in the ground, you cover it up. What comes up out of the ground? A plant. If you put a piece of corn in the ground, you don't get 
another piece of corn sticking up, at least not first, you get a plant. Well, what happened to it? What happened to that, we'll stay with corn, what happened to that piece of corn? Go ahead, we can stand it. <laughs> Did it die? It changed. It came to life. Maybe the seed was already dead. I don't know. If it was dead, no, there's a it wouldn't bring fruit to it. There's a difference in dead seed and living seed, by the way. You can have seed that won't germinate, it's dead. But a seed changes from one life form to another. Now, it's, it's buried, we would say in the sense it dies and that it is changed from what it is, but we actually know that it is a change of life. It is a change in a life form. Probably at some point in time you had some, some classes in school about metamorphosis, and you watched as the caterpillars. Any of you have a, a science teacher or a teacher in, in, in school that you brought a caterpillar into class? You fed it in a jar, and then you let it turn into a butterfly or a moth, whichever. None of you did this? Am I the only one who went to school? <laughs> uh, I, I remember doing the bean thing, too. My beans didn't sprout in fifth grade. They rotted. My pinto beans did not come to life. They just, they just stunk. So uh, anyway, I get, barely I can't grow beans. Um, the concept of metamorphosis, I heard that. <clears throat> of metamorphosis means we are changed from one thing into another. But we know that if you plant something, it turns into something else. And in order for it to turn into something else, you've got to it's got to go through a process. You've got to you got to bury it. You've got to you've got to plant it. It's it's dead. If you put a seed, corn seed on this table right now, how long would it last? do nothing until you put it in the ground, right? That's right. It would just sit there a long, long, long time. The same way with humans, I guess. Yeah. But, no, no. <laughs> humans will change rather rapidly <laughs> from one state to the next. Uh, I do know for a fact that if you do not harvest beans, they will grow from the plant while they're still hanging on the plant, they'll grow again if you don't harvest them. One year I told Libby I would plant the garden if she would take care of the garden. Mm -hmm. I finally ended up mowing it. Mm -hmm. I think there were three generations of beans growing from the... <clears throat> anyway, you, pl you put them in the ground. You, pl you plant them. And that's what Paul's talking about. What you sow is not made alive unless it dies. What you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain or something else. God gives it the body as he pleases, to each seed its own body. Next contrast, verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh. There is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, another of birds. Anybody have trouble understanding that? Paul's first concept is agriculture. Should have picked a smaller word. Seeds. Next he turns to, to uh, life biology. Um, I know this is troubling to us, but we do fall into the animal kingdom, not the plant kingdom. What kind of bodies do we see on animals? Any of you have animals? Dogs? Cats? Fish? Gerbils and hamsters? Uh, that's what we give little ones. Um, are they all the same? Nope, they're not. They are of the nature that they are. And um, we understand that they're all alive, but that they're all different. Okay, and that's Paul's contrast here, is that there are differences 
of things that we see. Uh, agriculturally, there are differences, and then when you plant them, there, there are differences. All right? Now, the animal kingdom is compared. Verse 40. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. The glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is the other. Okay, now he makes a comparison to, um, I think I could do this, sky and the earth. The heavenly bodies versus, versus those that live on the earth. What kind of things live on the earth? Plants, animals, things of that sort. What do we see up in the sky? The sun, the moon, stars. stars. Do we look at those things very often? Not like the people in the past. Because our lives are lived so much inside and with so much artificial light. Very seldom are we in natural light only after what we call dark. Uh, we turn on lights. We have lights on our car. We have lights around our house. We're not out in the darkness, so we don't see the stars and the moon and the sky like uh, others did. The sun and the moon? Yes, we do. And is there a difference between the things that are up in the heavens and the things that are on the earth? Yes, they're different. That's all, that's all Paul is describing, is that they represent a different kind of thing. They are not the same. Okay? Verse 41. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and even one star differs from another star in glory. So, we look at the sun. The sun is what it is. 93 million miles away from Earth, a blazing ball of hydrogen gas and helium and a few other compounds. And it's an amazing thing. I would uh, be willing to spend the whole class talking about nothing but the incredible nature of the sun. But when we got through, you just have a good science class and we still wouldn't have finished our lesson. So we need to do that. Why can we see the moon? The moon does not shine. It reflects light. The moon reflects the light of the sun. The reason you see the moon is because of the sun. If you did not have the sun, you wouldn't see the moon. If you didn't have the sun, you wouldn't have lots of other things. But uh, you wouldn't have the moon. Then the glory of the stars, and there are differences in the stars. So, we've got the sun, moon, Stars, are all of those visible things that everyone would have known? Sure. Paul is drawing from their observations of life. Everybody looks around and understands there's a difference in the sun and the moon and the stars. There are things on the earth. There are things above the earth. They are not the same, but they all exist. They are all reality. They're not made up. They're reality. They're different. But they're all, they are all the same. Verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. How is the resurrection of the dead like any of these things? Well, let him explain. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. All right, we've got some differences here. And now we're going to talk about power sown and raised. All right, what are they? Sown in, what's first? Corruption. Corruption. Raised in What does corruption mean? I think that's the decaying, <clears throat> decaying part. There. It is. How many of you like buttermilk? Anyone in here? <laughs> no buttermilk drinkers? I do. Bubble. You like buttermilk. You like milk that is on its way to being rotten. 
Actually, that's not entirely true, but it's sort of true. Cottage cheese is also a product that is on its way to degenerating, but we consume it. So are mushrooms. So are a variety of other foods that we regularly eat. They are on the way to breaking down. Now, there is a state in which they're edible and then they get where they're not edible. Uh, you probably, some of you were raised around farm life and uh, you may have killed, well, there's probably not very many in this room. Any of your parents actually slaughter a hog at home yourself? Okay, we've got a few. All right, let's take a, take, how about beef? Slaughter beef too? Bubba, when you killed a cow, did you do it yourself? Them? Your dad? Or did no, you take it to the slaughterhouse? Took the cow to the slaughterhouse. Cecil? Pigs. Hogs. Okay. Uh, beef cattle? Did you do it yourself? Started out doing them. Okay. <laughs> when you kill that beef, what did you do with it afterward? Okay, and after you cut it up? Did you eat it immediately? No. Why not? Much. Quantity. What else? A freshly slaughtered beef cow is not really what you want to eat. What do you do with beef cattle after you kill them, slaughter them? You let them age. Why do you let the cattle age after you slaughter them? There's a certain bacteria that actually helps break it down and become more edible. You have to allow a certain amount of decomposition occur in the meat in order for it to get to where we want to eat it. When you come and buy a steak or a roast from the grocery store, it, it didn't come from a cow yesterday or last week. It came from a slaughterhouse where it had been hanging in storage possibly for several weeks, maybe even a couple of months. Why? It's still in a refrigerated environment. It's not, it's not rotting exactly, but it is beginning to change its nature from one to another. The concept of corruption means that it is going from one state to another, breaking down to go to where it was before. Now you leave it long enough and it'll change past where we can stand it. But there's a period of time in there which we are interested in that process of corruption. Paul says our bodies are sown, planted, buried, in corruption. Now, human bodies change very rapidly from their living state to a very unpleasant state. Um, and we won't pursue that very far. If you have ever experienced one of your pets that you didn't find for a week or so after it had passed away in your yard. Uh, you understand that some things begin to have a very unpleasant, um, a very unpleasantness about them very rapidly. When Jesus went in John chapter 11 up to Bethany to see Lazarus after Lazarus had been dead for four days, why did Mary and Martha object to him moving the stone from the grave? Said, Lord, don't do it. By now he stinks. We are corruptible beings. That means our bodies change and decay. Okay? It's a natural process. God made us this way and it happens. But we are going to be raised in incorruption. When we go to the book of Revelation, look in chapter 20 and chapter 21. And when John describes in the Revelation one of the great things about heaven. What are the things that are not present in heaven that we experience here on earth? There's no more pain, no more sorrow, sorrow no more tears, crying, and no more death. There is no more death. Death is gone. Human things 
Earthly things die. Heavenly things do not die. The spiritual world to where we're going does not contain death. Now that's a very interesting picture. We are sown as corruptible beings, but we are raised in incorruption. Just hold on to that one for a minute. What's our next item in the list? Because I want to cover some more ground. Dishonor. Sown in dishonor. Raised in or honor. What does it mean to be sown in dishonor? How pleasant is a burial? How pleasant is the body of one that we're going to bury? After a very, very short period of time, it's extremely unpleasant. There, it is, it's a humbling thing to watch how quickly life goes to where we don't want to be around it. It doesn't matter how loved it was or they were to us. It quick, it, there is no honor in what happens to us after we die. But the resurrection, we are raised, it's not, it's not dishonorable. It's not something bad. We are raised in glory. We are glorious beings in the resurrection. There's been a change here. Okay. There's more there, but I've got to get on my list. Number three. Weakness. Beg your pardon? Weakness. We are sown in weakness. We are raised. Power. What ability do you have? When you're dead, you don't have any. <laughs> do what? When you're dead, you don't have any. Well, while you're alive. Well, he's talking about the what, what ability do you have? Justin, what could you do? Stanley, what can you do? <laughs> you work with wires and electricity all day. You put stuff together, take it apart, figure out what's wrong, things of that sort. What, what can you do? We have skills, we have talents, we have abilities. Okay? Do you have any power? What power do you have? I get a little bit of that, man. <laughs> On purpose? <laughs> On purpose. What power do you have? Jesus had uh, a bunch of hungry folks around him, and uh, he said, feed them. And they said, we, we can't feed these people. It would take years worth of money to feed all these people. What do you got? Well, we got a couple of fish and some, a little bit of bread. Jesus said, bring it to me. And he offered thanks, had them sit down on the ground, and said, uh, okay, then he distributed it to the disciples, and then they started passing it out, and they fed how many? Depends on which story. Yeah. Thousands and thousands and thousands with a couple of fish and a little bread. How did, th how did that happen? What did Jesus have that the apostles did not have? Uh, Jesus. Jesus had power. What did the apostles have? They have no power. They were weak. Jesus went into the room where a little girl was dead. Went in with her mother and her father, Peter, James, and John. And he took the little girl by the hand, and she was dead. And he had her rise up. Little girl, I say to you, arise. Why could Jesus do that? Because he had power. What power do we have? Almost none. We have no power. What power will we have? Paul says we'll be raised in power. That is power will be there and power will be ours. It will belong. All right? Number four. We're not through. Sewn in. Body. 
raised. Spiritual body. Everyone have spiritual body? Nobody has heavenly body? Natural body is raised a spiritual body or a heavenly body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. What's the difference in the natural body and the spiritual or heavenly body? Natural body has an end. At a certain time it will end. Spiritual body won't. What's the beginning of the natural body? Okay. And where did that begin? Okay, you go back and, and say, where did that come from? All of you, those of you who have had children, you had children, where'd they come from? You, okay. Well, where'd you come from? Well, your mom and dad. Okay, where'd they come from? Their mom and dad. Where'd they come from? Where'd they come from? Where'd they come from? Where'd they come from? We keep going back. Where did everybody who's ever been born come from? Their mom and dad. With the exception of, we go back far enough and we find where God created it. Now, we've been using a process that we had no power over whatsoever. God put the power in, inside of us that we don't really have control over, but we can apply in certain ways. Can you make a seed? No, you can take a seed and plant it and the seed will do what it's designed by God to do. The power's in the seed, it's not in the, not in the farmer. Uh, the power has been put into our bodies to reproduce. God made us that way. The creation story. We go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 where God says, reproduce after your kind. It is a power that God put into all living things. Make more like you. Do we have the power? No, but we have the ability to control certain elements of it. All right, we're going to be sown a natural body this, we're going to be raised something else. Where does this come from? Where does the spiritual or the heavenly body come from? God gives it. God creates it. Who created this one? God did. It's just been following the path down to that point. Who's going to create this one? God's going to create you into a new being. God's going to make you into a new being. Now that's an incredible thing. Does that mean you don't exist? No, you'll exist. It'll be you. When Jesus told the story in Luke chapter 16, and we go back to this story a lot because it's one of those hubs where lots and lots of spokes go through it. Jesus told the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man died. He woke up in torment. Lazarus died. He woke up in Abraham's bosoms. The angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. The rich man died and was buried. What is body that went to Hades and woke up in torment? Well, wait a minute. How, how did that happen? What was he? If his body was buried, what went to Hades? <clears throat> if Lazarus died, did Lazarus' body go to Abraham's bosom? Was, the, uh, was uh, Lazarus' body carried by the angels? Nope. What was carried by the angels? Lazarus was. Oh, wait a minute. What do you mean Lazarus was? Lazarus' body's dead. Yep, it was. But Lazarus wasn't dead. The being that was Lazarus continued to live. The being that was the rich man continued to live, although the body was dead. Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and he says, We are in a tent. And we groan, desiring that this tent be swallowed up with life. We don't have life yet. We have a borrowed form of life, but it's going to come to an end in death. The last enemy is going to be death. That's what Paul's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 15. All right, we've still got ways to go, so let's go. Okay. Um, 
Sown in dishonor is raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. It's a natural body as if it's sown. It's a spiritual body as it's raised. Verse 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, Paul makes another comparison here. Um, this one's a little different. <clears throat> We're going to compare... Two atoms. What's the first atom? Became a living being. What did Adam have to do with it? What does the word Adam mean, by the way? Did you know Adam's not just a name, it's a word? I mean it's a it's a description. Adam in Hebrew means what? Man means man. God called him man. Amen. Amen. We still use that, don't we? That was Adam. What are you? He's man. Adam. What's woman? Hebrew for, for woman? Adam. Close. Adama. <laughs> female, female form. Or you can have Ish and Isha, but that's, that's the, uh, the husband and wife. Okay, Adam became a living being. God made Adam, and Adam was alive, and Adam had the ability to reproduce. Why did Adam have the ability to reproduce? He was designed that way. Yes. And because he was what, he had the ability to reproduce. What do all living things have the ability to do? Oops, I just gave it away. Adam was able to reproduce because he was alive. Living things reproduce. Dead things don't. All right. Did he have power? No. It was the power was in him. Okay. First Adam is became a living being. Second Adam was a life-giving spirit. What's the difference in these? Was an Adam a life-giving spirit? Didn't he have the ability to give life? Uh, within, within the realm of what God had given him the authority to do, yes, he had the ability to do that. But there's a difference in what Jesus is able to do and what God, what uh, what man is able to do. Who has the ability to give life now after you're dead? See, all power for us ends at the grave. Everything we've got here ends. But Jesus' power begins at the grave. First man was made from the earth. The second is of the, of the Spirit. Verse 45. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. Then afterward, the spiritual. The first man, verse 47, was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. As is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. We look like Adam. Now we don't look exactly like Adam, but we, we are like Adam. We are flesh, we are blood, we are, we are human, we have heads and arms and eyes and hair and all the things that humans have always had. Our skin may be different. Certain things are going to be different. But we are bodies just like Adam was. And when we become, after the resurrection, who are we going to be like? We're not going to be like first Adam. Who are we going to be like? We're going to be like second Adam. Who is second Adam? Jesus. What is Jesus like?
Mm. Well, now you just stole my thunder. <laughs> we probably don't have time, but let's try. Philippians chapter 3, and we'll have to end here, I'm pretty sure. Verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Verse 21, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Paul said, Our, we're looking for heaven. Why are we looking for heaven? Because God is going to change us into the kind of being Jesus is. He is going to transform our natural body into a spiritual body, and we're going to be like him. 1 John chapter 3, two verses. 1 John chapter 3. Verse 1. Behold what manner the love, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Why couldn't Moses see God? He was still in his natural body. He was still in the natural body. So what? Jump ahead to next week. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We can't go to heaven in the body we've got. They are incompatible. Moses couldn't see God because God was spiritual. We can't see what we're going to be, but we're going to be like He is. Now, does it scare you when you see God? When you think about God? Does it scare you when you think about Jesus? As John described it in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. He created all things. All things were by Him, for Him, through Him. Does that scare you? No, it doesn't scare you. Why not? Because, because He is. Then it should not scare you to think about you being there because you'll be like them. That's where we're going. If that doesn't make you feel good about what's to come in your life, we'll try some more next week. Thank you for your time and attention. We'll start right there. Verse 50. Next week we get ready.